Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm Hugo Disler from Farming Secrets. And I'm Helen Disler from Farming Secrets. And it's lovely to see you all here today. And um, we're going to get going straight away with our... Oh, gosh, sorry. Oh, gosh, where are we? Sorry, you've just whipped off the page. Um, we're going to share our screen and we've got a little PowerPoint to go through with you today. And we have this was already. Um, Sorry, I've lost my little so here. We are. Just have to move that. Right. Okay, so we'll start this now. Right, well, today it's all about composting with worms made easy, and it's based on a work we did with David Davidson. Here's David out in his paddock, and he is showing the lush grass he has now because of using vermicast and vermicast teas. He also put compost worms directly into that paddock. On the right, you will see David with his neighbours, uh, Yonka and her two little twin boys. They also, you'll see them a bit later, make compost tea and put it in their veggie garden, and it is totally safe for children to use. So do, do you want to go through those different types of bins here? Well, not really, but I will. Uh, uh, the main thing is that worms don't like plastic. So the, these plastic bins, which have a place, but should be treated seriously. Uh, and I'll go straight on to the never fill bin. The never fill bin is a timber thing there. And the main feature about it is the air that flows flows in those gaps and uh, the, the air, so the composting is actually, if you've got composting material, it's actually uh, really helped by the air going, uh, going from underneath and through those gaps. And uh, when you're feeding the earthworms on the, on the top, they uh, will keep eating the stuff from the, from the top and create a fantastic compost. All right, well, we'll be going into that just a little bit later, but Dave, I used to go to the markets and these are the different types of bins he sold and probably the one that's most common is the one at the top on the stand, which has the trays and you feed the worms and you keep making layers with them. But as Hugo said, um, they're not really good for worms because they're very hard for the air to get in. On the next picture, he's holding a cylinder that's one that um, has, he's drilled holes in the side and it goes into the ground and you put worms and, um, at the bottom and you drop your food waste in and it then leaks out to the soil around that cylinder. The next one is a bucket with a lid and it's called the dog poop bin or something like that. <laughs> you dig a hole, put it in, put the worms in the bottom and drop your dog droppings into that bin and put the lid on so it's level with the ground and it's I think it's a great way to get rid of rid of dog droppings I think the council should use them actually even though it is a plastic bin um the next one oh no the next same one's thing. a dog poo yes yeah, the same one. Water, uh, can you please mute whoever's talking um this one with the coils is a um, another plastic bin which works the same as that worm cafe at the top. Uh, that's looking inside the yeah, never fill bin, Hugo. It's a bit hard to understand that because that's sitting on a gravel, and it's a demonstration by David that uh, you put any put material there, bits of cardboard, uh, vegetable scraps on the left hand side. And on the right hand side of that picture, you see that um, it's the finished compost. Like that is the actually the finished compost which you get from the bottom of the 
vermicompost bin. Okay, we'll go on to David. We've got a little thing. Here's bigger um, worm bins you can have if you've got land around you. Uh, well, depending on the size, what depending on what the the challenge you've got of really getting rid of waste, that's the size you you build your um, your um, build whatever to house the waste. Yeah, and also if you're because if you're a farmer and you do have a lot of acreage, you actually don't need a lot of vermicast to make your own tea. Um, it's that's why we're so pleased about the Neverfield bin. Um, a little video here now of Tavo um, talking about the worm bin. As well as all our fruit and veggie, broccoli, uh, tissues. And if we scrape down just a few, so underneath the paper, we can see that it's absolutely teeming with nice, fat, healthy compost worms. So he started this bin with worms so at the, the bottom. important to have the simple layers of uh, cardboard or no, you don't have to have that same emphasis as you do when you're making compost because the worms are continually working through the whole lot and doing their own mixing. What we do do, and here's a good example of it, with our food scraps, uh, because there may be bits of meat and bits of dairy and other things that have the, run the risk of having flies in it, the best wraps all our food scraps up in newspaper like a packet of fish and chips. And this one pretty well almost started to be decomposing, but that was a, and as you see, as we open it up, uh, it's almost impossible to see that that was one veggie scraps because uh, the worms had very well got into it. But what we do with that packet of fish and chips is we place that right in the center of the center of the bin. And then with our lawn clippings and our newspaper, we put that around the outside. So it gives that extra bit of protection against any potential smell or also deterring rodents or things like that from wanting to get in it because the real stuff's right in the middle. Everything we keep nice and wet. This happens to be just under a, a drain pipe. So we get rain, it's going to keep it nice and moist. And it's really only in the really hot weather that we actually have to uh, um, add some more water to it because that it, it retains the moisture very well. Okay, on to the next slide. Oh gosh, move along. It's not wanting to go on. <laughs> Sorry about this. As well. Okay, so here Davo is, uh, the worm bin's just around the corner, you can see it he decided he'd start a no-dig garden. And what he does, he, he lays black plastic. He's got the four boards around the corner there for the garden. He simply laid black plastic, put a whole lot of um, clay in it. He's got very, very poor soil and the soil he dumped in there was shocking actually. But he put the vermicast in there as well and um, put his layers of uh, newspaper, the vermicast, and very quickly that became soil because there were worms in the vermicast as well. And um, so this was the result very quickly. Um, it became soil. Here he is with Yonko. Hugo, you might like to explain the system here. Well, it's not, actually not a system, that's a good part of it. it it's uh, uh, old hay bales or straw, no, it was hay bales, just around the perimeter. And they, that doesn't have to be any particular size. So depending on the size of your hay bales, how many you've got or how much waste you've got, then you uh, put your compost in the middle and um, the earthworms have a beautiful home, both in the hay bales and, and in the, um, and in the compost you're putting in the center. And if you want to, you can cover it with a bit of hay on the top, but there's no probably no need for that other than keeping flies away. So um, it, it's a very good combination of um, getting rid of the waste, 
a very quick bint that you can make, especially if you're a farmer and you've got available hay bales and um, and you've got waste and you, and the she, whole process starts. She had it next to the, near the house uh, and had the grey water going into that um, compost. And the illustration is that once that um, you're using worms and that started with some worms in that pile, um, it's really safe. This worms are a lot produce an antibacterial um, result. So the, the boys were just playing in it. it. It was just lovely to see how simple this is. And she's over the road from Davo, so she would have had a lot of help and all her start with worms. So that just a little illustration of her. And here she is with Davo. They've put some of that compost into the watering can mixed it around just a handful of the compost and it becomes a very simple uh, worm tea. It's safe and it's um, uh, just, worms are just naturally safe. You don't have to worry about balance and all this sort of stuff. And this is a very, very simple way to run your veggie garden. This was David's effort to come over there with a uh, watering can with uh, fermi compost tea in the watering can to uh, water in some seedlings to show, well, later on, we, well, it was a demonstration how the uh, vermicompost tea got seedlings going. And there the kids uh, are putting the seedlings in the ground. And they were really keen. <laughs> uh, do you want to talk about this? Well, that's, yes, there, I'll briefly mention it, that, uh, that uh, that's a 200 litre bin and, um, there's a little, that little white thing is a, a fish tank bubbler aerator. And that is enough to aerate that 200 litre bin. And, and you, Worm about, farms. you put in about three kilos into- Mum wants in, to make a worm farm. Yeah, okay. Uh, you put about three kilos into that, uh, into that water, a bit of fish, Fertilizer, maybe a bit of seaweed fertilizer, like and them into the garden, and within sixteen to twenty-four hours, yeah, compost grew. That is um, capable um, of um, well, ten liters to the hectare. Yeah, yes, compost. Yeah. Okay. In the garden. Yeah. So here we have Hugo showing worms in the garden. No, the worms stay oh, in the worm farms. Yeah, um, the voice is still coming through, so well, you please. can't take some of them away. But... How, do they, how do you not get them? Do you have to go through every single bit? What? How do, you, how do they Sorry. stay in there? Unmute, please. Mute, no, not unmute. Oh, mute, mute. mute. Sorry. <laughs> You're right, you go. Mute. Okay, so here's a very, very basic demonstration with Hugo, but it's. Um, the basics of making vermicompost tea. Hanging out with Hugo, who was showing me uh, how to make vermicompost tea using an aerated technique and letting it brew over 24 hours. And I thought, this is just so good that we need to share it. So we turned on the camera and made a quick video uh, that shows you the advantages uh, of brewing your own vermicompost tea and how to use that. Uh, and the difference between what we showed you in our last video, which is on YouTube, if you haven't checked it out, it's a really quick version of how you can make a quick vermicompost with just quickly stirring it in a pot. But today we're showing you the technique that takes a little bit longer. It's about 24 hours to brew it. And by aerating it over a 24 hour period, you're going to amplify the effects. I think I looked at my Gmail and I missed it entirely. Um, bacteria and fungi in that tea. And so as you go, uh, will share that you can actually invest in a microscope and look at the before and after of this vermicompost tea. So let's join Hugo, who's going to share us, show us and share with us how to make the longer version of the vermicompost tea. Let's do it. Hi, I'm Hugo Dizzler, co-founder of Farming Secrets. Now we also have Ray Melodoni on board. So with the trio, we're really ready to fire. And I want to show you people something so simple, it's laughable. It's very effective. So here we go, straight into it. We've got, by using fish, using vermi compost that is uh, preferably with got woody material in it, 
and I'd like to see a bit more wooding material than that. What we do, I'll talk about the 20 litre container and then we'll talk about uh, the 200 litre container. But before we do, the, one thing is quite important, that the containers that you're using have, shouldn't have poisons in them. If you have had poisons in them, treat them properly, either with a commercial uh, product that gets rid of the poisons or urea. And so this one's had fish fertilizer, this one's had uh, uh, cod liver oil in it. So we'll talk about the 20 litre container and then you can multiply by 10 for the 200 litre container. Now what I've got here is about 300 grams of vermicompost. It's got woody material in it. Like I said before, we'll prefer to have more woody material in there to get the fungi going. So you just drop it into a 20 litre container and that's the other thing too, is the water is like and clean. It cannot be chlorinated. If it's chlorinated, you'd want to aerate it for 12, preferably 24 hours. Now, in that goes the uh, approximately 300 grams of, of vermicompost, 100 grams of sugar. In it goes, raw sugar. And we put a bit of fish fertilizer. We only need 10 grams. 10 mils of fish fertilizer. So as you can see, that's a 10 mil spoon. Oops. There we go, a little bit more, but that's a matter. And you don't have to use fish uh, seaweed, but if you want to use seaweed, there's good, good products you can use. I'm not recommending any brands. Personally, I like using uh, a, a dry seaweed. You don't have to use it, but I'll just put a little bit in. You don't need much. Right. Then, it's quite a slight virtue, like putting your hands up. Then we have these $30 little fish aerator. It's not a pump, it's actually an aerator. And on it, we have, you don't need two hoses, but that's what I bought because that's what I had in the shop. I'm a fish from an aquarium shop. And I've got lead weights on there twist around to work keep down the bottom. Bonk it in. Put it, if, you've got, if you're lucky enough, like who I am, to have a power point nearby, outside, but you can have this inside, there's no need to be outside. Plug it in, and away we go. It's just gently aerating. And after 24 hours, that will be a beautiful brew ready to use. And you can, uh, if you've got a microscope, and you can look at a check on our website uh, and we'll buy a microscope course, it's well worth it after you sort of know a bit more about this sort of thing. You can check how the things, how the microbes are going, because the more complex the thing is, the more uh, different things in there, protozoas, and, um, and you're lucky if you have a nematode in there, but the more advanced, um, uh, uh, not microbes, the better. Now, getting it out, 20 litres is enough for one hectare. And actually, that could be two hectares. And for a home gardener, you use a watering can and one litre, or I personally use only half a litre of this stuff into a watering can and water it out liberally on the roots. Be careful that uh, if you're too heavy handed, you might, can get a lot of leaf growth and something like cabbages, you get a lot of leaf growth and you don't get enough part. So um, be, it's supposed to be a little bit uh, cautious. And with, commercially, if, you, if you're using this, uh, if you're using a boom spray, filter it. If you're not using a boom spray, a single jet will do anything up to 20, 20 metres. One single jet. Go and look at our website for those jets. And uh, that was a little interesting thing what I do. I Because I have every now and then a bird or something flops in the water, I have a bit of netting here so animals can get out if they do get into the water. It's amazing how many times, a few times, animals have got into the water. And um, a little pump there. Basically, you want to keep it dry. So I just cut it up and stand the outside. That's it. Have fun, and um, it's a very effective way of getting a fertilizer that virtually costs you nothing. Well, cents, a few cents, as you can see.
there we are using a single jet, which will go out to 20 meters and using some pretty rough uh, equipment and a, a firefighting pump to uh, pump out of a, uh, well, one of those plastic uh, thousand liter containers. So it's very effective and you can see how lush the grass is on, on David's property. And this was the result of um, applying the vermicompost tea. He's just is so delighted because when he puts his spade in, um, he's probably getting a lot more now. This was early days of him applying teas to his farm. So um, David's just going to show you his um, vermi compost, a uh, vermi cast compared to common compost. These are all on YouTube if you want to go back to see them. Well, what we've got here is as close as you can get to uh, pure vermicast or worm casting. That originally was stable manure and straw, uh, and it's been well and truly processed by the worms. Uh, and that when you apply to the soil and especially to gardens and things like that, you only need a maximum of 10% mixed in with your normal soil. The university tests have shown that any more than 10% is wasted because that's, if you put a sample under the microscope, you just see it as absolutely teeming with bacteria and fungi and, and all the other biology that, that goes with it. So that's the end product that we sell a lot of that at the farmer's market. People just like to come up and run their hands through it because it's just the ultimate, yep. the ultimate in, in just fine, healthy soil. The next box we've got here is a much more coarser version of the same thing. It hasn't been processed as long, but we deliberately leave it in a coarser fashion because that has a much higher fungal content than the, the finer stuff. So the, the fungi need more uh, organic material to attach themselves to and to breed in. They need the extra carbon from the straw and things like that. So this is the material that we're currently providing to some of the professional uh, tea brewers because we find that's got the, uh, the ideal. So this picture is here because Dave I recently had just bought a bricks meter to measure uh, what was happening out in the paddocks. And um, he started going around to neighbouring farms with it and found that quite a few of the farms didn't even rate with their pastures on the bricks meter. Uh, so it's a really handy tool. And we talked about that on our last webinar. Here's Martin Stapper, obviously not on Davo's farm. This is a horse farm nearby. And he was using the bricks meter, which he always does when he goes out into a paddock, um, including digging the soil, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, Davo, Davo was very pleased that uh, within a short time, he was getting a reading, of no, no, a reading of nine, as you can see on that scale there, to get nine is, is well, it's pretty good. And he also did some readings on uh, grass elsewhere on a neighbouring farm with permission, and the reading was almost zero on, on the same sort of same sort of grass. Um, funnily enough, when, when we were there, it was some time ago, he had just paid $300 for that refractometer, the bricks meter. So it just goes to show. Um, well, you can get them much shipped. That's, what that's right. Say. That's what we are talking last time. Yeah. <laughs> I see Chris McKay's on the call here and he sells them for, I think it's around $25. So uh, there's really, um, and, and you can buy one and share it with your neighbours. You, you know, probably put in $5 each, five neighbours and share the bricks meter. It's an indestructible tool. The last favourite, it's got no batteries in it. Uh, and this last slide to show that um, I was filming Davo's horses were coming up and they're just so peaceful and placid. He can go up and feed his cattle and once again hear the children safely applying this fertiliser. Um, so we'll go back out of here. Um, oh. David Murphy wrote the book Organic Growing with Worms. We rang David and unfortunately they're out of stock. Um, 
it's just a, a fantastic book. Um, and we'll take the other one. I think we'll just stop this um, sharing at the moment. We'll come back to that. Um, where are we here? Um, well, I don't know what's going on. Someone else is on our screen. Anyway, um, here's his book. If you can see it. Uh, we are going to be speaking to him on Friday to see if we can get more. Okay, so my name is here. I don't know what's happened here. Um, at all. This has not happened before. We go back here. Wait. Uh, all right, well, let's go to questions while I'm trying to get back at the screen here. Any questions from anyone today? Uh, unmute yourself if there's anyone and wave your hand. I'll, I'll just do a little bit of talking. Uh, with this vermicompost tea, it's probably the best uh, liquid that you can uh, put out onto your paddocks that's uh, as a general liquid um, and it's very very inexpensive and it can be and you only need a very small amount to do a, a large acreage uh, we used to we did film someone on four and a half thousand acres who's using that equipment and they've also well i use it at home on a very small acre on a very small area so it doesn't matter what size area you've got um, with its thousands of acres or home garden, this vermicompost tea uh, and using the never filled bin is a great asset. And the, um, you can tell and make it if you're missing something in your soil, you can just put a tiny, tiny amount in your compost. And um, our Q Love will always put silica in, for instance, he loves silica. So, <laughs> um, you can always tailor make it to your property as well. But I think that's a subject we'll cover later. Okay. I have a question for you. Yeah. Please. Who's that? Mike. Uh, this is Mike yeah. from uh, Los Angeles. Hi, Mike. <laughs> Hi. Uh, so I uh, do you recommend, because uh, I, I do some plants and hydroponically, do you recommend this instead of fertilizer, like hydroponic fertilizer? Can you just do the earthworm tea instead? That's an area I've never looked into, Mike, but um, I imagine you, you could, uh, I'm pretty sure you could, and what you would find that your other fertilizers which you're using will work that much more efficiently if you, if you combine them with a vermicompost tea. It's, uh, farmers have found that, uh, I shouldn't say it, but when they're using poisons, that instead of using a litre of poison to the hectare, they can find that they can get down to even 200 mils or 100 mils of poison when they use uh, compost tea with a poison. So the same thing happens with when you additives in your uh, fer when you're using fertilizer additives, you can you get away with a far small amount of the fertilizer when it's combined with a, a, a vermicompost tea. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So it definitely would work to some degree or to a major degree. Just to add a little bit more information to that, <clears throat> I did use um, uh, worm casting and uh, tea in a a gravel. It was I, I ended up changing it to a wicking bed in the end, but um, I just started off with uh, gravel, and um, it went for about two years. And yeah, I, I got good crops the first two years and then after that, um, I was mainly growing tomatoes and started getting a little bit of potassium uh, issues. So uh, I'm not quite sure where that came from, from the purple edges on the leaves. So I um, ended up um, uh, changing it over to a wicking bed. And uh, yeah, I was growing tomatoes. I grew them for, for about 28 months straight. So um, yeah, the same tomato plants, not, not replaced after a few months, they kept growing. But I also have a question about um, those boxes you were showing there. Are they treated timber or not? 
Uh, yes, because... they are treated, but um, treated with uh, su supposedly safe products. The funny thing is, we've we've uh, uh, people that would make them themselves out of uh, old pellets uh, and just put the pellet boards somehow together to form uh, a sort of a, the main thing is to uh, have it all off the ground so you can shovel this, the oh. ready-made product from out and have plenty of gaps for the air to be um, in, in them. So, but also, Dave, I said the worms deal with those sort know. of things. I didn't pull the sheets off. Sorry, who's yeah. that? Uh, any, anyhow, what about um, were, um, mice attacking, getting in through the slats in the boards? That does happen. Uh, Dave, David's answer is, is two answers for that. I'm not too sure if they... I, I have difficulties with uh, vermin in my bin. So, um, to, and he, his answer is first wrap up anything that the vermin would like in the middle of the bin. And the other one is to... Hose, hose are quite regular, use plenty of water. And I have found that's quite effective, that when you uh, have a rat problem here, uh, natural rats, uh, the bush rats, and um, I heavily hose my bin and they stay away for a number of days. Okay, someone's but got- But it is a problem. <laughs> uh Someone's got a raised hand here and I actually can't see. So, uh, Phil, hi, how are you going? Thank, good, thanks, Alan. Um, I just wanted to ask, uh, we use a lot of extracts with our vermicast. When you're talking about making a tea, what sort of um, feed are you putting in for the tea? Um, So molasses, uh, emulsion. No, I know. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, can put in no. molasses. No, that with the um, well, we have there is a formula, but you can be pretty. Uh, you can do your own guesswork on on that. But in the video, you saw what the proportions that uh, which we've worked out from another farmer who's using it extensively. He's, he has four and a half thousand acres that's using his proportions. Um, now the. Main thing is to have some, something there to feed the bacteria, which is either molasses or sugar. And um, you can put urea in there too to feed, to feed the bacteria. But we prefer you don't, don't use urea. Um, no. And then if fish fertilizer is something that's been proven by many people to work. And uh, people like using seaweed, but as David Davidson said, if it makes you feel good, use a seaweed, otherwise don't bother. There's also a worm tea recipe that um, we can make available to you afterwards. Phil, so does that okay. answer your question? Yeah, thanks, Alan. Yeah, great. Okay. Uh, that, it's a very Sorry. interesting point that you say, say because uh, extracts, uh, making a compost tea from an extract using the process where you violently uh, separate the goodies from the, from the material, uh, the vermicompost tea is um, a superior process. I'm not knocking one price against, not comparing one price against another one, but the vermicompost tea, when you look under the microscope, it get, can get, and it does get extremely complex with uh, bacteria and fungi as well. And I'll just go back, Mark, uh, you're asking about using it for hydroponics. Hydroponics, um, from my understanding, doesn't um, rely on the soil. The vermicast, putting vermicast teas in would give some of that um, complexity back into what you're providing for the plants. Nothing can beat the complex. Uh, I'm a mute, I mean. <laughs> uh, it's adding back that complexity to your making it available to the plant. So I'd really encourage you to use something like a vermicast for your hydroponics. Um, I hope that makes sense. Okay, uh, Diego, would you like to unmute? Yeah, hi. Good, hi. good evening. Uh, hi. I'm, I'm here in South America in Ecuador. Wow, welcome. Yeah. <laughs> I have a question for you. 
uh, when you use um, uh, um, someone is with the it's talking also it's, you know perhaps could uh, mute the, the uh, someone is talking also please yes please um get off the call if you i can't find them on the um yeah well um, my question is is this i, I hope know. you can listen when you use a brewing with co when you use a compost a very compost to, to to brew when you're brewing that very compost you are add it's not a fertilizer fertilizer right you're adding more bacteria and fungus and protozoa and and all that stuff to the soil right it's not a fertilizer right Oh, the word fertilizer is a very loose word, so <laughs> you just have to use um, it's um, it makes the plants grow, so you don't know. Oh, no, look, sometimes you do need uh, a lot a lot of a particular one product. So that uh, usually find the vermicompost tea is sufficient to get uh, your, the, the material in the soil, which is usually bedrock material in some format, right through to sand, silt and clay, and it gets that bedrock material activated and available to the, to the plant through microbial action. So that's the main reason of the compost tea or uh, the vermicompost tea is to activate your existing basic bedrock material, as I said, can be anything from coarse material down to silt. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Diego? Yeah, thanks too much. Yeah. But, really as a, but, as a short, but as a shortcut, you might go and bulk out something like single super or um, uh, more lime than you, sh than you really should. And th there's, but now there's in, in Australia, they used to for years talk about uh, one ton of uh, lime to to one ton of, to one acre. Uh, that was a traditional. Anything smaller than that was a waste of time. Well, now farmers have found that they can go out there with as little as four hundred kilograms to a hectare of lime and get the same result if the soil is biologically active, if the microbes are working. So sometimes you have to bulk out the product, but we find from farmer experience that the volume is, is not as big as, as they make. It's not as big as it used to be. But I'm, not, I'm not going to tell you that's not the case when you're growing a, a, a very hungry crop like potatoes, then you may have to bulk out the stuff. Okay. Thanks, Diego. Thanks so uh, much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I hope you can hear me over this noise in the background. It's pretty bad. Yeah, we can, and I cannot find. And I someone said to buy a button, but I'm frightened I'll mute everyone. So we'll just have to bear with it. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll ask everyone again. Please mute your microphones. There's a little button on the left-hand corner. Mark, Mark Latras. You can find him in the list of the participants. Mark Latras. Yes, thank you, but I can't actually um, work that control. I'm a bit new at all this, so I apologise. Okay, well, I'll, oh, we've got a sudden bit of silence. Okay, so um, I've got a little bit of a um, problem. I've been thinking about what to do. And it's either like a compost or a worm solution. Um, I'm part of a group that um, goes on retreats every uh, twice a year. And um, at one of those retreats, there's 50 people there. And the other time, there's over 100. And during that week or two or three, there's ma it's vegetarian. So there's masses and masses of food waste, um, you know, scraps from veggies. And um, I've just been pondering how best to deal with that, given that it's not an ongoing, like it's not a household thing, but it's this just once or twice a year, this massive amount of veggie waste. And so what I've been thinking about is just trying to make big, comp like uh, on-site 
all in one go compost like get all that veggie scraps get your um, spent hay and your your brown stuff whatever it might be all ready you've got your green you've got your brown mix it all you know and then have one big working bee with that massive amount of veggie stuff or as we're doing it like you know half throw through the week put the veggies in then put your brown on top and then da 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 da, da like that um yeah. and thermal and compost yeah. with either compost like with a three bay pallet system or trying to do it as a worm farm type thing so i just thought i'd throw that in because what we want is basically that that vegetable ways to percolate through the rest of the year and set up some no dig gardens so we've got herbs and so on whatever growing but you know it's not people aren't there all the time to look after it so i'm looking for a kind of solution to manage this huge amount of veg vegetable waste i'll put it out there gail i might have an answer for you which i discovered by default um very early speak, sorry you go oh, hugo. Hi, sorry very yeah, early yeah. Very early in the piece, I was using a Gettys bin. And after reading the book from David Murphy, he referred to them as a worm mausoleum. So I thought, OK, I'll stop using it. So I completely stopped using the, the Gettys bin. And it had worms in it. And I thought, well, I just let them die out. I thought I let them die out. And after four years of this Gettys bin being stagnant, nothing being used, I thought, just for the heck of it, I threw some scraps on the top of it. And unbelievably, all these worms appeared and started hopping into the scraps. That was after four years of no use. So maybe there's an answer there, uh, uh, Gail. What a, I'm not sure what a Geddes bin is, sorry. I'm sorry. Did... It looks like an upside down rubbish bin. Oh, with the yeah. Lid. Oh. Yeah, oh, it's totally the old, steel. Oh, I know the, compost, the old um, uh, style compost bins. Yeah. Yeah, with a, with a lid on it. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. It's a worm mausoleum, according to David Murphy. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I guess whatever I am do, I'm going to sort of follow... You know, I've read Nicole Masters stuff um, that, you know, it's going to be green and brown, whatever it is, whether it's just worms, worm farm style or compost style. It's basically um, I can't just let these vegetable scraps rot because it's going no. to just be uh, rats and vermin. It's in the middle of the bush here and uh, outside in New South Wales, but it just can't just I mean, it's a pretty bad system that they're doing now, which is just leaving it all somewhere. So. Well, the well, worms are very, very worms are very, very quick. You could look at say by burying them, like having a big container in the ground with holes or something, and chucking, it, putting worms at the bottom, and putting all the food in. They will process that very quickly. Oh, but we're dealing with um, rugged, um, uh, you know, bush outside of Sydney, uh, like near Mudgee. I don't know if you know it anyway, but it's very rocky ground, so that you can't really right. dig into it. So. But we'll think, but anyway, I just wondered if anyone, if you think that's that, I was thinking of like really the three bay pallet system with star pickets yeah. and pallets to make a three bay system and then have the browns material ready and just kind of layer it up as yeah. you would in a compost system and chuck some and you worms. Could, you could cover it. Um, what Davo does when he brings in his waste, he's doing a really big, large scale commercial waste now. He brings right. it all in and dump it into those bays of straw bales. He puts yeah. soil on it, he puts a bit of lime, and he plants sweet corn and flowers. Okay. And so he actually has... He has a no-dig garden on top of it. On so top speak. of that huge bay. So you could look at something like that as well. No, I was looking at those straw bales kind of system, actually. So is that um, uh, on in a video on the on the soil... Um, farming secrets. It's site. actually on another video. There may be clips. I'm not sure, girl, but um, we have mind. another video. Pardon? I wouldn't mind just going back and looking at that picture that you showed us of the straw bales and the system. I didn't kind of, it went too quickly for me. So if I could, um, at some, yeah. some access that at some, somehow. Um, oh, we might have to rely on the recording, girl, because I, um, don't know how to get back into that. 
Oh, think well, don't worry. It. I'll go back and watch this again because we're. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. And we, oh. it looks like we should have another one on larger scale worm composting as well. So uh, we will. I do. I've, got, I've got compost and I've got worm farms going personally, but that's a very small scale to these yeah. you know, massive, massive amount of hundreds of kilos of veggie waste, but just twice a year. Okay, well, yeah. thank you. Well, can I can I add to that as well, please? Yeah, go okay. um, yeah. ahead. Hello there. Um, yeah, Hart is a compost master, actually. <laughs> whatever system you decide to operate, um, I think it's important that you keep in mind a couple of really important rules. Uh, one of which is to make sure that you keep the pile aerobic. Um, and have, have, have it so that, particularly with veggie scraps, which are higher in, in water content, uh, they, they tend to become a bit of a, a slush. So a bit of practice to get the brown material, but make sure it's dry as well. Yeah. Uh, and mixing it thoroughly, uh, because you can get layers of mucky stuff that uh, sort of is the veggie scraps and then some dry stuff next to it. And that's not going to decompose either. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. The other, the other one that's really important is overlooked by a lot of people, particularly when you're looking at static piles of composting, and that is the core temperature needs to be kept at 70 degrees or less, um, and to get pasteurisation, you need 55 degrees um, or between 55 and 70 degrees. So that becomes a bit of a challenge sometimes, and you know if you're setting and forgetting, well. You need to. I mean, can I ask Gail what what volume are we actually talking about? We're talking about a cubic meter because that's a minimum for a thermophilic composting pile. To yes, get uh, well, I was thinking of the cube, I was thinking I was thinking of the three bay pallet system, which is a cubic meter. Each of those is a cubic meter, mm. um, but the amount of waste is huge. If you imagine the big, very big uh, garbage bins, you know, on wheels, wheelie bins. Yep. completely full of veggie scraps like twice or three times a week for um, four to six weeks at one over the Christmas period and then a couple of weeks in the other. So there's a massive amount of veggie scraps to start with. So I appreciate that. I've got to find a lot of brown stuff um, and maybe bring mm. in some spent hay from local farms or, um, you know, in this cow manure, but I hardly need any more nitrogen so, sort of stuff. I just, and I'll, I was going to use biodynamic comp um, the compost things as well, maybe if I do a static system. But I think the challenge is getting enough brown stuff because we'll need a hell of a lot to balance that out. And I appreciate your point about, you know, thin layers and mixing with them. So. Yeah, and, and the other thing, of course, is look at the other end of it too. One of the things that hasn't been mentioned about uh, worm farms or, or having vermicompost is that it does carry through... Um, weed seeds and weed propagules as one of the sort of downsides of it. So um, particularly if you've got tomatoes that are in that mix, um, you soon see that you've got a lot of tomatoes seedlings coming up the next season when, when you go to use it. Um, Can I just ask one final question, Gerhard and, and Helen and anybody? Um, would you go with this issue, would you go worm farm versus compost or? Would you do a regular, you know, regular compost stuff, which is worms are in there anyway? But in my experience, um, uh, if you want more protozoa, then it seems as though the, the worm compost, the vermicast, is actually much higher in protozoa. Um, but that starts going down the pathway of saying, all right, um, we're not going to have the time nor the capacity of the worms to deal with uh, fibrous material, lignans, and and um, woody materials, which uh, really were the most benefits got with compost because most of our agricultural systems are depleting our fungi because we're cultivating the soil, we're, we're not building on top of it. Um, we're not using, uh, generally speaking, we're not using um, green manure crops as well as we could be. Um, and so any disturbance of the soil is going to push fungi out of the fungi are fragile, bacteria or not. So um, getting back to that, I actually run personally in my own little place here uh, on the farm in South Gippsland. Um, I've got a compost pile that I've got bulk materials that I'm able to process through that compost. And it's a wireframe one um, 
that Eli and Ingham brought to my attention 20 years ago. Um, and I also run a couple of those plastic um, worm farms as well. So I'm running compost worms there. And that is what I use my kitchen scraps for to, to process too. those. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly what I do. So I've got the big compost heaps, but I've also got the little black plastic, da da da, multiple layers and um, for my veggie scraps. Yeah. Because I just build yeah. my compost heap in one go and then it sits, yeah, in one big. Very good. Heap. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We've, we've got, put, um, put, I'll just cut across there. We've got baths, we've got that Geddes bin, we've got an open one, we've got the Neverfill bin, the Neverfill bin outruns them all it processes that food so quickly it is a never fill bin for us and we have a lot of waste and scrap particularly from the garden beds so i and when you saw the vermicompost that davo showed in that video it certainly um breaks down to very very fine stuff but he leaves the woody material so the fungi can grow when he makes his tea as you know Gerhard was mentioning so that's just adding in there um yeah. so thank you very much thank you very much Gail um is there anyone else who would like to unmute and join the conversation yes of uh it's Morris here I've had my hand up for a little while um just oh, Sorry, Morris, I can't find you here. Just a minute. Are, are you yeah, on? Um... A question for you. Um, with the, I, I've got a, a small holding in Northern Rivers, New South Wales, that responds to Lyme. Um, and I'm just wondering how often we should, I should be looking at applying the com, the Vermi Post D. Um, and starting from scratch, how long would it be before I could expect, you know, some sort of result? And, and when should I apply the lime? Um, Morris, you, uh, this is a pasture situation. Yes. Um, well, there's two subjects there. Um, the putting out the vermicompost tea. Um, if you if you if you're making a vermicompost tea, you can put a very small amounts of lime in your in your uh, vermicompost bin or in your compost. But the amounts of lime you put in there have got to be very small, uh, handfuls or shovelfuls. You, uh, not not even shovelfuls. So very small amount, and that lime will get uh, expanded exponentially. So you might. So you may find that you don't need the, the lime you thought you need. The, uh, when it comes to application of the vermicompost tea, um, you'll, you'll start reading it for yourself. Uh, people have seen the gr grass greening up overnight, uh, uh, one or two shades darker just from one application. And um, so you'll start reading the situation for yourself. Uh, initially, you'll uh, put out uh, as often as you feel like doing it. In your sort of climate, you might put it out, um, as, <laughs> depending on how much energy you've got. Uh, you, you can't overdo the vermicompost tea. And then you'll also find, like uh, some people have found, that they're only putting it out every second year. And uh, well, may, may not, maybe not at all, because they've they started to manage their cattle, so the cattle are doing the the work, not not the teas. So, so it's a quite a complex answer. The answer is not a, an easy answer. Uh, it's really a, and then <laughs> the other thing too is you, you, once you learn how to uh, look at your soil, a visual soil assessment, you start reading the soil, and you and you can sort of see for yourself things are changing in the soil, and I, that's another. That's that would take two probably two uh, sessions to go through visual soil assessment. Uh, Recording in progress. 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 Okay, thank you. Um, more, just a, one follow-on question. I, I've recently had a, an area of uh, giant paramata grass, it's been a problem, or paramata grass has been a problem, and I've sprayed that out, and we're planning on 
working that up and planting a winter crop, which will um, plow back in to help the soil. So is the vermicompost likely to be of assistance in that scheme? And when would you apply? Well, uh, you'd apply as, as soon as you can, um, because the vermicompost has a, has a, um, a, a peculiar action. One is, it, 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 I've got a lot of feedback, so I have a difficulty saying what I want to say. So um, I'll just keep battling on. Sorry. I've seen logged in twice. Here you go. Yeah, uh, uh, going to, uh, going to, uh, going to. Uh, Sorry, just sorry, just for a minute. I'm going to the, the vermicompost tea has a double a double action. One is it physically uh, 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 feed, feeds the soil, and this uh, physically with all the goodies feeds uh, whatever you want to feed, foliar feed or the soil. The other reaction is this: that once the microbes and the fungi are dead, especially the microbes are dead. They, then they uh, become a food source for the next lot of microbes who, who uh, get into action from a heavy dew or from a rainfall or whatever. So you get this chain reaction going, even though farmers have sprayed out on dry soil. It's not recommended to put it on dry soil, but f big far farmers with big acreages find that they cannot do the ideal timing early morning or late afternoon or evening to spray. They're spraying right throughout the day, hot, hot days and all. And they, they very get very good results because you get that uh, secondary reaction where the, the leftover, whatever's left over becomes a food source for the next lot of microbes and fungi to keep working. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we're about coming to the end now, so I'm going to go back to sharing my screen. What you will get today on this offer, we've made it a really super duper offer, is a video um, which is a digital download and it goes right through what we've been showing you today. It actually shows you how to make a never fill bin, which is the one we really recommend because it works and it's really quick um, if you've got the room. So that's what comes in this kit, plus the audio. So if you're up, out in the paddock or in your car, you can just listen to it and come back later if you want to, to look at what you're talking about. It's pretty self-explanatory. And there is an ebook version, which also includes how to build your never fill bin. So that ebook version, I think it's about 30 pages, um, has the illustrations from the video in it. And so if you prefer to read than going on your computer or anything like that, a bit of nice nighttime reading, uh, you can read all about um, making your own compost, making your compost teas, all the things we showed you today and heap more obviously are available in that ebook version. Uh, then Hugo, after we did this filming, which um, was in several locations, Hugo then did a QA and a interview about uh, more in-depth questions with David that our members had put to us to ask David. So that's an extra bonus again. Um, and the worm tea recipe, which we did say we'd make free to all um, attendees of the webinar. So if you're listening to this replay, um, if you can't find the worm tea recipe, it is on the Soil Learning website, which is where this replay will, if you want to hear it, if you're hearing it, that's where you are. Uh, it's under freebies with the worm tea recipe. And it also happens to be that this DVD has been made into a course. So you can go through and access it as though you were doing a course and you'll have lifetime access to that. So it's pretty good. Um, I think it's a fantastic offer of being completely um, informed as to how to use compost worms 
and use all the do's and don'ts of what you do, how to make your compost teas, no deep gardens, a discussion about the other bins and how to use them. And you're probably wondering what it's going to cost. It's cheap as chips. It was 47 or it is normally 47. Right now you can buy it for only $27. So if you want to get it, make sure you make up your mind and um, this will have a link to it for you to click and buy it straight away while you remember it. So thank you very, very much for being on the call today. And we are putting this um, discussion up into the region Facebook group, that's the regenerative farmers who know the value of healthy soils. There is a link somewhere around where you can join that and continue a discussion with people about how you're making your teas, how you're making your compost, um, how you're applying them out in the paddocks or in your garden. It's, um, I, I just think that's the bee's knees of offers. So, um, and we'd love your support too and interest. So it's $27 today. So um, thank you very, very much for being here. And we will end the call now.